Hello, everybody. I, uh, I guess the most important thing I'm going to say here to the church group is I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in John 3.16. I believe in the Golden Rule. I believe in the Ten Commandments. And uh, I'm scared of heights. Yeah, it's a fact. I've jumped out of an airplane 1,100 times and never jumped out of an airplane where I didn't, I didn't say the Lord's Prayer first. That's the most important thing I'm gonna say. Ever jumped out of an airplane five miles in the air in the dark with 100 pounds of shit strapped to you, most of it that would blow him up? Yeah, yeah, I said the Lord's Prayer first every time. But uh, I, went in the, I went in the Army in 1981, the day they swore Ronald Reagan and his president thinking we were going to fight the Iranians. Uh, came, uh, Coming home from the recruiting station, you know, they take you there at like four in the morning, right? And uh, I got in a little Army K car to, uh, to get driven home by the recruiter, and, it, and he reached over and turned on the radio. First thing that came out of the radio was, now that, now that we've let the hostages go, how do you think we should give them back their money? And the guy said, wrapped in 500-pound bombs. And I went, holy shit, I just dropped out of college for nothing. But uh, I, uh, I decided to have have a little bit of fun with it, I guess, while I was in there. Uh, I went to be a paratrooper at the 82nd because they told me there was no slots to be in a Ranger Battalion or Special Forces. I, uh, I showed up at the 82nd, the first jump out of the plane, they were cherry jumping me, and uh, the guy pack trade me out of the plane. And I remember my parachute opening while my feet were tangled up in the parachute in front of me and it's scaring the shit out of me as a young private. That's probably why it scared the crap out of me every time I jumped out of a plane. But I kept doing it, right? Put on the, uh, the armor of God, I think somebody said over there earlier. Yeah. You know, see, I was young and dumb guy, and I thought I was doing a package check when my fingers didn't fall in. I had to jump, so I jumped. And uh, what you learn as you get older, that uh, without the big man upstairs, you're, you're really nobody, right? But I went on to do... Uh, my first uh, danger tour was not, uh, they did not pay me house to fire pay. I went into Bolivia for, uh, for about 13 months uh, chasing the druggies as a military advisor to the uh, drug war. My biggest, uh, my biggest bust was 365 kilos. That's a lot of cocaine. And we had to take a judge with us everywhere we went because we went so far out into the jungle chasing where they did it. You ever been shot at by a shotgun from people running through the, when you're not really supposed to shoot back? It's kind of fun, the banana leaves falling all over you. But yeah, we had to take a judge with us everywhere we went. And, uh, and I remember, uh, hey, we got nobody to fly this plane out of here. We had the, we had the guy all cuffed up. And, uh, and uh, he wants to blow it up. We were half joking. He said, yep. So I blew up a Cessna 206 with a buddy of mine. And uh, that pilot was going crazy. He didn't much like that. A few days later, I went out to blow up the airstrip. All right? Was going through the middle of this uh, grapefruit orchard out in the Amazon River Basin. And uh, I didn't know that USAID from the embassy had been out there doing water projects. And I blew their water line up. <laughs> they were pissed. But uh, yeah, there was two of us, two Americans out in the middle of the, uh, the Amazon River Basin chasing around the juggies, finding a way to blow up their planes. It was kind of scary because uh, we didn't have anybody to pull guard like he did. We'd be out there, no windows, mosquitoes tearing you up. Half the police you were working with were, were paid off by the druggies. But uh, I had a good time, I'm glad I did it. Kept a lot of cocaine off the streets of the United States. Just a handful of people didn't get addicted because of it, so I feel like I accomplished something. Came back and went to Columbia for a, for a tour on the, the maiden voyage of putting military advisors in there for the drug war. They didn't let us get anywhere out where you could, where you got mixed up with the, with the FARC or anybody. So it was, uh, it was pretty uneventful. It was a learning experience though, because I remember one time walking in from town 
we went into town to get dinner and walking back and this old uh, 55 Chevy coming by, driving back and forth and doing loops and coming back by. And I start walking everywhere with my pistol in my hand behind me and, and, uh, and it rolls up alongside of us and it's, they roll down the windows and the marijuana smoke came billowing out. And we could see through the marijuana smoke, it was the officers from the drug unit. <laughs> I was like, oh no, we're not winning this one. <laughs> but, uh, and then uh, the invasion of Panama came. I took my first prisoner of war there. I didn't have to jump in. I remember the first firefight I ended up in, I didn't have a, have a, fire, I didn't have a weapon in my hand at the moment. It taught me for the rest of the time that I was in service, you don't let that damn thing out of arm's reach. <laughs> I was on a US military base, on, on uh, Allport Air Force Base. And they came driving up in buses up to the fence and just unloaded the buses full of people and they started machine gunning us. And I remember uh, US M113 is coming to respond and seeing our gunfire going at the Panamanians and didn't know that we weren't the Panamanians and started lighting us up with 50s. Yeah, fun stuff when you're a small, small special forces unit. People don't usually know where you're running around. That was the first time I got a combat infantry badge. They didn't really acknowledge the drug war stuff. And then, uh, and I pretty well said Lord's Prayer every time they were shooting at me too. I went back to the States and did an advisor job because I was a, a, like, a, like an instructor job. And uh, I called it an advisor job, but I was, a, I was teaching because I was one of the first ones with uh, combat experience since the Vietnam War. The, uh, and from there, I went over to Asia for, for a number of years. I was on the theater uh, version of, of uh, like the mini theater forward version. They call it a sink, sink and extremist force, but it's a counter-terrorist counter response force for the Pacific theater. And uh, got to go to Cambodia twice in, uh, in the aftermath of the Vietnam vet guys here. The, uh, uh, they were, that place, that place was crazy still. The, uh, the Khmer Rouge were still running around and, and we were trying to help them clean up the landmines mostly and uh, collecting intel on seeing if we could come up with any of the remains from the POWs. And uh, that biggest firefighter ended up in there. I started dating an Australian version of a, of a CIA agent. She was badass looking. But every time we went on a date, she would try to work and work first. And I remember getting chased around in a Toyota by a bunch of guys shooting AKs at us going, what the hell did you just get me into? <laughs> yeah. But uh, that was different. I don't think I said my prayers that time. Uh, I ended up doing the, uh, ended up doing the, uh, we called it beveled edge, but it was with the, the uh, coup in Cambodia when they, when they were overthrowing the government back in the late 90s. And uh, and that was pretty interesting watching the politics of the, of the generals. I was an assaulter. So uh, when it came time for, uh, we called them snots, the sniper observer teams. And uh, they would pull the outside perimeter for whatever target we were going to take. And uh, we were the guys that got up close and personal, blew the doors and went, went through on the inside. And uh, it was kind of funny watching the politics because at the time, now I'm a master sergeant at this point in my life, a very new one. And... Uh, all the generals are coming around, personally observing, trying to figure out, okay, this is going to be a very high-vis thing. The, uh, who are we going to let take the embassy? And uh, the Marines were lobbying and why it should be the Marines, and uh, the SEALs were lobbying why it should be the SEALs, and, and we were, we slash I was the guy that had to do the lobbying to see if it was going to be the Special Forces guys or not. It was kind of funny the way that all plays out, but uh, it is uh, the politics, the politics of military operations was eye-opening for me. But, uh, but we got selected. Uh, Tommy Harveston got a bronze star and it wasn't really a, I think he's now the first Special Forces Group CSM. But uh, that, was, that was pretty cool. I went over there three times to Cambodia over the years. And, uh, and they ended up in Northern India for another, uh, where we got paid hostile fire tour, but it never really made the news uh, to teach the Indians how to do hostage rescue. Uh, that was pretty fun running around up there in the, 
in the Himalayas. Came back from there and uh, got sent to instructor duty again. I was running the uh, Special Forces Communications School and uh, when I got there, all the equipment was all the equipment was old. They weren't. They were fielding all these new radios and communication things to the force, and nobody was buying enough for the to teach the students. So all the students were learning on the team, and it was a pet peeve for me uh, where I was because I'd have these Kamo guys show up, and I'd hand them the radios and say, "Get that stuff ready. We're loading out." And they'd look at me and go, "I'd never seen that radio before." I was like, "Are you kidding me?" The uh, but. Uh, so I was fortunate they let me revamp the Q course. A lot of my uh, peers got mad at me because I threw out Morse code. They were spending three months teaching, teaching people to get to 1515 on Morse code, send and receive. And, uh, and I needed that time to teach the computers and the new satellite radios and, and all that stuff and got to revamp it and, and put them back in technical situations and out of the classroom some. And, uh, and they still do the Q course that way today. I got. I'm the only guy, enlisted guy I know that's got six month, months of company commander time. They PCS'd my major because he didn't know how to reinvent the course and let me do it. And, uh, and then when I was done rewriting the course, they brought in a new major and he got pissed because I was telling him what to do. <laughs> the uh, ridiculous stuff. But, uh, but uh, I went from there to the Sergeant Majors Academy. And from the Sergeant Majors Academy, I went to uh, 3rd Battalion, 5th Special Forces Group and, uh, and deployed as the... Uh, the initial entry uh, breach into Afghanistan in 2001 with, uh, with the unit that would later become uh, famous with the book, The Horse Soldiers and the uh, movie 12 Strong. Uh, I, will, I will tell you, uh, boy, I have some images in my head of that I don't think I want to describe. But, the, uh, but I remember taking the helicopter flight out of Uzbekistan and going into Afghanistan when all the gunfire, the tracers were coming out up, up at us pretty hard. It's still the first few days of the war. And uh, uh, for those of you who uh, ever saw back in history when the, there was a picture on the front of uh, most of the newspapers in the country, there's a picture of a guy with a blown up MIG in the back walking in, in desert camis and it went all over the damn country. It was on Larry King, the news, and my friends busted my chops about that more than you have any idea. They started calling me Hollywood because I ended up on the front of every damn newspaper. You don't, when you're supposed to be the quiet, hiding in the back guy, you don't want to be on the front of the newspaper, just saying, it's a thing. But uh, I remember when we finally landed, I, uh, I was singing the Star Spangled Banner to myself while they were shooting at me. I probably should have been singing. I probably, I probably should have been singing to him or saying prayers, but I was, I was reminding myself. To me, it was important to remind myself why I was there. I had two stepsisters they hadn't found yet that lived in Manhattan from the uh, impact. It was still real early in the war, and uh, and my focus was was uh, going to make the world a better place. Somebody, somebody, somebody has to take the sword and. And, and fight the fallen angel. And uh, I felt, felt like it was my place in life to be that person. I, I have not many regrets about what I did in Afghanistan. Uh, I did the recon to open the, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers them talking about Freedom Ridge. Colin Powell was on the news talking about it a few times. But uh, I did the recon of the route and the, uh, and the estimate to see if, uh, if we could drive tanks across the bridge. So I had to do all the engineering to see how much weight it would hold and, and uh, send back the report. I remember some female major up at, up at Starfleet uh, was the one that got to decide if what I said was right or not. And, uh, and she agreed with everything I said that we could get tanks across the bridge. And for some reason she thought the dirt road that I drove a Toyota bus from from the airport to the, to the bridge that we couldn't get tanks down the dirt road that I wrote. <laughs> I remember sending back a real nasty message and them sending her boss down to inspect and me taking him on a tour on a bus and chewing his ass <laughs> about, that, about that female major wasting my time. I was pretty much a smart ass with him. I said, next time you go take your ass back there, if I send you something and tell you there's a UFO out here, you send somebody with a camera and do exactly what I say. And he did not like it. His eyes got about this big, who the hell's this cat? <laughs> but uh, I wasn't happy with him. But uh, anyway, 
But uh, so we, we dropped the, the country, the first, the first part of the country, we're in the north. Uh, after the, the prisoner uprising at Kuala Jangi, I don't know if anybody remembers that, uh, we caught uh, the American Taliban, Johnny Walker Lind, and uh, he was not a happy person. Uh, he, uh, yeah, I don't know if I wanna get too graphic with the descriptions of that guy, but, uh, but I sometimes used to have to feed him while we figured out how we could get him back to the rear. We were stuck with him. We were in a little building, we called it the Turkish schoolhouse. It was the old uh, girls, uh, the old girls school in Mazari Sharif. It was right on the fork of, of two major roads where a highway came into town and kind of ended and then the two roads went through the city and the, and the compound was shaped like a wedge with a big, and uh, uh, we got him and Mikey Spann was killed at the, about the same time. And uh, we, finally got, we finally got Mikey Spann back out and we were, we were holding him in like a, in like a root cellar. We didn't, there, was no, there was no power in that building. There was no water. The windows were all shot out. The, uh, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of crazy images in my head there too. But, uh, but we, finally, we finally got him out. He, he became the notorious American. And then shortly after that, we got the dual citizen. Uh, and I forget his name, but he was part Iranian and, and from Louisiana was born in Louisiana, he had dual citizenship, U.S., and, and uh, he, was much, he was much calmer uh, and easier to handle. But uh, he just wanted to, he was scared to death. Uh, Johnny Walker Lynn was an antagonistic, nasty, dirty human being. And uh, the, uh, but I came, I came back from there and, uh, and uh, got, I went from being the, the Opsard major to, uh, and we were, we were tactical. I mean, we had a, we had a B team, about 15 guys in, the, in northern Afghanistan. There was only 225 Americans in country at the time. And uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of support from the Air Force and the, and the Navy's uh, aircraft. But uh, almost, all of our, almost all of our initial casualties came from uh, the, first, the first five that were friends of mine were Paul Syverson, uh, then Captain Leahy, uh, Dave Betts, uh, Beck, the Camo guy, and an, uh, and, I, uh, and an Air Force guy who, who I, don't, I didn't know his name. He was an attachment. He was an uh, air controller. But, but the, uh, the F-18 pilot put the grid coordinates in backwards in the smart bomb in the, nine in the nine line. Two of the lines are one is your position and one is the target's position and you give your position so they can plot it and know not to fly over it. They're supposed to come in at an angle so a long or short bomb won't land on you. And uh, they put them in backwards and they put the, uh, the observer position in the computer in a, in, a, in a guided smart bomb. You know the kind you see go right in the window? They, uh, they, they put the, uh, the observer position in the coordinates uh, for the target and backwards and, uh, and it blew up my friends. Uh, the homeless shelter we have in the western part of uh, Pennsylvania is now ma named after Paul Syverson. Uh, he, was, he was wounded severely, uh, I believe it was the 25th of November. The Blur War gets a little complicated, but, the, uh, but it was, I believe it was the 25th of November, the day the JDAM came down on them, and uh, we, we got them out. His face will be in my, his, his, his face bloodied and... and uh, Captain Leahy's and, and, uh, and Dave Betts will, will uh, share my dreams for a number of years yet to come, I'm sure. But, uh, but we came back, got ready. I became a team sergeant and stood up a team of new Q course graduates and uh, went into uh, part of the initial invasion into Iraq and became part of what was, was uh, commonly known as the Thunder Run. Uh, uh, the, only, the only cool thing I've probably done in my life is uh, you know when the statue went over? Anybody ever seen that, those pictures of the statue going over? They pulled down the Saddam statue. Anyway, my interpreter wound up the crowd for me and I got that pulled over. I was kind of proud of that. I thought that was fun. The, uh, the uh, coolest performance bullet I ever got in my, my life on an NCOER was personally responsible for creating civil unrest in Western Baghdad. And they didn't just do it once, they did it twice. They did incompetence and leadership both. The, uh, yeah, uh, hey, what'd you do good for leadership? Caused a riot. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyway, ridiculous stuff, right? But uh, but it was kind of uh, 
kind of interesting when we do the thunder run. I, I helped clear the, uh, the airfield. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff on the way north too, but uh, at the airfield, uh, I, have, I was with a 12-man team, and we had to clear the whole SRG barracks by ourselves. And uh, in, the, in the intensity of the fighting uh, going on, fighting for the whole airport, because the one side is, is, uh, is the SRG barracks, the Special Republican Guard is, is like their, uh, their big unit. The, the Bayup Airport is adjacent to the castle that, that was Saddam's main house. And uh, so the best military unit was right there at the airport adjacent to the castle. And, uh, and when, the, when, the, when the regular military tasked, tasked to clear, this, clear these barracks, they tasked the special forces group and they didn't realize the only thing that was there was, was 12 guys, right? So, so good comic relief. We have to go through these whole buildings. And uh, fortunately we had some air support. And, uh, but, uh, and then the main fight on the compound, that engineer got the Medal of Honor while we were, while we were fighting. We were fighting the other side. But uh, the, uh, when we came out and finished clearing the, uh, clearing the, uh, the castle compound, uh, I, I made a really crazy decision that, that, uh, that I was, uh, that I wonder if, if uh, in hindsight I would do again but uh, we're clearing, we've, we've, taken the, we've taken the airport, we've taken the, the palace and close into the palace and the, and the compound is pretty sprawling. And so uh, uh, the third infantry division has kind of locked down all the, all the main buildings at the palace and we're thinking, hey man, what's back there? And uh, so we jumped in a Humvee and went riding out to the backside and uh, there we find some uh, people going through a bunch of the smaller cottages in the back and we roll up on them and, uh, and uh, start to figure out what the hell are you doing here. And uh, they're basically looting the place is what's going on. There's an open gate in the back wall and, and I'm concerned with the security. We're too small an element to, to do as much protection as the big force. And uh, I end up in a shouting match with, a, with an Iraqi. And, uh, and I'm... Uh, using very strong uh, four-letter language about, and he's speaking perfect English, with no accent, I might add. Uh, there's two of them, but one of them's doing all the talking. And, uh, and we're yelling at each other that you're going out that gate or I'm putting a hole in you. You can pick, I don't much kiss which one you take, but well, one of these two things is happening. And he's yelling back that he's not going anywhere and that uh, Saddam owes him this. And I'm going, I don't care what Saddam owns you. You're getting the hell out of here. I'm not having you inside my perimeter, kind of. We're going back and forth and back and forth. And he ripped off his shirt and held up his arms. And they looked like, like this. And the scars that were on there, he goes, you see this? You see this? And, and, and he's in four-letter lang four language, too, uh, and screaming, this is what he did to me. You know what he did to us if we didn't agree with him? He would take us, and he went on a rant about how Saddam's people broke his arms and snapped them and moved them and would splint them crooked like that so they could never heal. And, and it, it, it brought me up. And I went, you take what you need to take, but you lock the door when you leave. And the guy said, okay. And I jumped in the Humvee and drove away. I couldn't let the guy, I couldn't, I couldn't. How do you, how do you face that much evil? How do you deny somebody some degree of peace that had to live with that much evil? I, uh, I wish I could tell you I'd make the deci same decision again, but I can tell you that's the one I made. And uh, that is not one of the things that haunts me. So, uh, and that is always a plus. The, uh, but, uh, but we went on to take, uh, take, this, take the city of Baghdad, and, uh, and I was fortunate to find who to the bio witch's house, number 44, Number 16, the Jacket Club's house, Kusei's chief of staff, their secretary of defense, the chief of staff of the Air Force. And uh, I had a pretty good run. I was walking the streets in a Mets hat and, uh, and talking, talking to people, the only one in a Mets hat. I liked it that way. They needed to know who to talk to for who would do different. Uh, I carried a cell phone that would work anywhere through anything to talk to some very specific people uh, for if things were found, which was which, which, uh, which probably uh, 
which probably motivated me to feel like what I was doing uh, was more important than, than uh, if I had not had that, what risk I would take. The, uh, and uh, some, some of the riots were hard on me. Some of the riots were hard on me because uh, when you're a small element into a part of the city where they did not want you there and they were still loyal to Saddam, uh, when they came out in mass, it, it, uh, it, was, a, it was a thing. And uh, I had that problem in the jungles of Bolivia one time uh, where I was with a bunch of D agents and they ran on me. And, uh, and I had to do the, I had to do the, with the armor of God. And, uh, and I felt like I was by myself, I remember and uh, said my prayers and turned and walked straight at the attack. There was no way with my, my little pistol I was gonna be able to do anything about it and started talking in broken Spanish to people that spoke an Indian dialect about they didn't want anything to do with me and why they needed to go into town and talk to the police that sent us because I was just a nobody and did my best to talk my way out of it because there's no way in hell. I was, there was hundreds of them with dynamite, light and fuses and chucking dynamite. The, uh, so when you hold, you hold that thought, right now you go into, into Iraq, you're going into these back cities and, they, and they're, they're uh, more capable to fight and, uh, and they're, they're, uh, they're coming at you. It comes back to you very quickly what your past is, right? And uh, so those, those days were hard on me. I kind of skipped over that part in the drug war, but, uh, but it becomes a compounding factor, I guess, when I go to Iraq. And then... Uh, I broke my back in Kuse's chief of staff's house. Uh, we were doing a, we were doing a uh, kind of an impromptu raid. Uh, I knew the guy that lived in the house was very important. I didn't know who he was, but I knew he was very important. For a couple of days, I've been working that part of the city, and all the neighbors had ratted out. And uh, the, uh, and I see the guy go in the house. So I look at the captain I'm with from the Third Infantry Division. I go, hey. We're going in that house. He goes, when? We're going in that house. Like now? Yep, we're going in that house. We got $4 million and, and uh, all his computers and cell phones and everything. And I didn't get that guy. I don't know what hidey hole he got into, but it, I didn't get him and I followed him in the house. I got all five of his bodyguards though. And, uh, and uh, the intel we got out of there was, was pretty powerful as I understand it. And, uh, but uh, I break my back that day and end up, end up uh, getting sent back home. And I uh, tore my thumb, they, they, they put my thumb together pretty well. Uh, when I got home, I thought I was getting out and uh, came out on the Sergeant Major's list, much to my surprise. And so I stayed in, I thought I was getting out on a medical. And so I hid uh, all the problems from my broken back uh, and just kept, kept going to work like it didn't happen. And, uh, uh, got sent, got sent to, uh, Mike Stack got killed in Easter 2004. So I got sent over to finish his tour and, uh, ended up doing some, some civ civilian clothes things in, in Baghdad that, that, uh, caused me to say my prayers regularly. I will tell you, if you drive in a little orange Toyota through, through Baghdad in a time of war in civilian clothes and you run up on a Marine checkpoint, it gets, it gets harrowing if you have an M4. The, uh, trying to convince them that you're no threat. But, uh, and arguably those are my most stressful moments of the war was coming up on those checkpoints. I get out of the service because of that broken back. On, uh, they, they decide they're sending me to Korea to be the four-star general's op sergeant major. And, uh, and I say, hey, I can't go to Korea. There's no doctors over there that can help me. What do you mean doctors? Well, I got a broken back. And uh, anyway. When I went to the doctors to get my letter saying I couldn't go to Korea, they started the medical evaluation board and medically chaperoned me out of the army. Uh, and so then they lose my retirement paperwork. And so I got out like a private. I had no income at all. Went from making a sergeant major's income to flat zero and uh, had to figure out the VA system to untangle it. And when I figured it out, Okay, life's good, I finally figured it out. It took me some time, 
but I'd be sitting in the VA in a waiting room or something and listen to some other vet across the room complaining about similar problems. And I'd go, hey, let me buy you a cup of coffee when we're done. We'll go down, I'll, I'll buy you lunch or something. And, uh, uh, and that, turned into, that turned into me learning to do VA claims. I'm now an accredited claims agent with the VA. And, uh, and then that grew because I started volunteering at a food pantry and everybody in the line at the food pantry seemed to be a vet or married to a vet. And uh, well, it is what it is. And, uh, and, and from that, all of a sudden, next thing I know, people are showing up my door at 10 o'clock at night with homeless vets. Hey, can you help Bob? Well, what do you want me to do for Bob? Well, Bob lives under the bridge. What do you mean lives under the bridge? He's homeless, he lives under the bridge. You gotta help him. And I didn't, I didn't know how to help him. And I started doing the research, how to help him and figuring it out. And, uh, and that has grown now to, uh, to, to, we have a homeless shelter in the West End of Monroe County in Eastern Pennsylvania for specifically for veterans. We have a 200 acre counseling center in uh, Carbon County. Uh, it's important that we have it in Carbon County because Carbon County has the highest veteran suicide rate in the state of Pennsylvania. I will, I will tell you, I, I almost never agree with doctors on uh, how to deal with PTSD. Uh, I spent two years interning with a, with a doctor and what I learned with the doctor, I congealed with what I know about veteran behavior. And uh, the, the, uh, I've used it in helping shape our programs to our recidivism rate is, uh, is very low. It's five veterans after eight years out of about 150. And our suicide rate is, in, that's after eight years. We didn't get open our homeless shelter until 2014. But uh, our counseling programs have been in place since 2012, and uh, uh, we have never uh, lost a veteran to suicide that's participated in our program um, in 10 years. And uh, so uh, we think the combination of talents and innovative hippie doctor has built some pretty good programs. Uh, in 2019, our peak year, uh, we went from in 2012 when we got our nonprofit status. I had been helping as a Good Samaritan from about 2008 and it outgrew me in 2011. I started putting together a board of directors. And uh, by 20, and we have 35 or 50 vets, a small number in 2012. But by 2019, uh, we helped almost 1,900, 1,879 or some crazy number like that. And uh, through COVID, it dipped. Uh, we still helped 1,024 in 2020. And uh, it was about 1,400 in 2021. I don't know what the numbers are gonna be for 2022. COVID has still left its fingerprints on us. But, uh, but I will tell you, we did not yield in the face. We did not yield in the face of COVID. We kept our programs up and going. We kept our homeless shelter open. We kept our homeless outreach in the street going. We kept our counseling programs going because uh, if, if the people that would go face the hail of bullets will face the hail of bullets, then we should face the hail of face masks and, and stand with them through the hard times. And uh, I, I will tell you in many ways, I get to be the voice and not the doer anymore. But, but our outcomes became uh, reasonably well known in the, western, in the eastern part of Pennsylvania. And uh, it has gotten me appointed to be the chairman of the Veterans Health Benefits Committee for the state's Veterans Commission and got me appointed to the Long-Term Care Council as a vet veterans representative to, for the state for veterans that end up in long-term care. I think homeless shelters, not homeless shelters, nursing homes and assist the living facilities uh, and to help shape policy for the governor on, on two different fronts. So uh, I like to think that it's a good uh, battlefield indicator that what we're doing is, is uh, okay and people are starting to notice. But, uh, but I will tell you, uh, the team, the team around me, uh, you can't clap enough for them. One of them's in the back of the room, by the way. The, uh, but uh, I, I, uh, the trouble, if you'd have told me that I was gonna do this when I got out of the service, I'd have laughed at you. I'm just telling you, I'd have laughed at you. My, my TSSCI clearance was still active. Uh, my human intelligence uh, experiences and my door kicker experiences were still current. I, I could have got a job making an ass load of money, fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars a day, and I chose to stay home. And then this thing just—it came to me. This God's hand is in this, not mine. I'm, and uh, 
God has a plan. He hasn't told me what it is all the time until it lands in my lap. But, uh, but it, has been my, it has been my duty to rise, to, to meet the need. And, and uh, when my day comes, I hope he finds me worthy because I will tell you every day, I doubt if I'm doing enough. Call me. Uh, you, can, you can send us a message on Facebook, keyword Valor Clinic. Uh, I, I would say call my work cell phone. It's out, I put it out in there so it wouldn't ring while we are in here. But uh, 570-534-2998. I will tell you, if you talk about the big problems for veteran suicide, uh, number one, according to the CDC, is relationship collapse. Uh, we can help you learn to bridge the, the relationship conflict points between the different behavior norms in veteran life versus civilian life. Uh, the next one is long-term uh, physical health problems, uh, stripping people of hope, veterans of hope. Uh, we can help you find ways to get back on your feet and build a plan to, to live a more purposeful life uh, where it becomes less of a hindrance. Uh, the third big one is addiction. We don't currently do addiction well, but we can help you, we can help you manage the things that make you want to self-medicate. And the fourth one is uh, long-term uh, financial problems, and, uh, and we'll figure out how to help you with those two if you need it. Uh, but uh, we're your teammates, and uh, we don't have any obligation to report PTSD things to, to judges or courts or ATF or, or even the VA. If you want to come work through your issues with us, you're safe, and, uh, and we'll help you as best we can. You, can. you can bring your wife, girlfriend, husband, boyfriend with you. We'll, bring you, we'll let you come as a couple. We'll let you come alone. We'll, we'll do whatever. We'll meet you where you are and help find an answer that works for you. I'll buy you a bus ticket. I'll come get you if I have to, or get one of my teammates to come get you.